All right. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Innovators Connect and welcome to today's session, the first session for today with Howard Yu. The competitive advantage that accrues from scale, great brands or patents is evanescent. But looking back to history, this session will show that companies that survived dramatic shifts were able to leap from one knowledge system or foundational discipline to another. Successful companies have to leap into new areas of foundational knowledge. Based on the award-winning bestseller, Leap, four core principles will be explored and discussed. First, understand your firm's foundational knowledge and its trajectory. Second, acquire and cultivate new knowledge disciplines. Third, leverage seismic shifts. And fourth, experiment to gain evidence. And by the way, I just uh, found out that the Japanese version of the book has just uh, launched last week. Um, our guest, uh, Howard Yu, is the Lego Professor of Management and Innovation, as well as the Director of IMD's Signature Program, the Advanced Management Program. So I'm really keen to dive in. Uh, before we do that, I want to do a quick shout out to our partners for making this virtual summit possible. So thanks to Planbox, IDScale, Board of Innovation, Alpha, Mural, and Chromatic for making this possible. Um, for all of you on the line, I would like you to know that there is a chat box in the Q&A box um, available in the webinar tool. Usually it's somewhere at the bottom, but it might be in one of the corners. Uh, at any time, just feel free to ask a question, post a comment um, in the Q&A or the chat box, and I will then feed them uh, to Howard for him to answer. So with that being said, I think um, it's time to dive right in. Howard, welcome. Great to be here. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone dialing in across the world. I'm really excited to have this particular conversation, just like Hans mentioned. If you have any question along the way, please type in your questions. Hans will interrupt me. Either I would clarify the question that you might have during the webinar, or we'll save it towards the end of the session, then I'll answer all of them as well. Now, the key uh, research agenda that I had at IMD in Switzerland, by the way, the uh, view that you've seen on the slide is called Lake Le Monde, which is the Lake Geneva, which is about five minutes drive away from the school that I'm in in Switzerland, is all vineyard. And from that angle, that really began my research uh, journey. Because as I travel around the world talking to executive and business leader, one of the key areas that they mention or the strategic challenge that they face is product commoditization. They find it increasingly harder and harder to differentiate a product in the marketplace. And not only they are subject to pricing pressure, but increasingly they see is the latecomer, the copycat that would topple existing giant. Let me give you a bit of concrete idea and example, what do I mean by this latecomer would have, in, would, would possess advantage over early pioneer. Now you think about across different industry sector, whether it's personal computer to telecom equipment, mobile phone, cars, all the way to green energy like wind turbine. Historically, these are the Western company who dominate and pioneer these sectors. Whether it's IBM and Dell and HP in personal computer, or automotive, whether it's GM, Ford and Chrysler in Detroit, responsible for American auto industry, or even wind turbine, GE investors, these are pioneering company from the West. Of course, today, if you look across the world, it's the latecomer, oftentimes initially are the copycat, that dominate these sectors. Whereas personal computer, of course, is Samsung and Lenovo from Asia. The reason that Huawei is subject to so much controversy is again, they begin in the low end and increasingly become better and better. And over the years, they pushed out Nokia and Ericsson to be the world global leader. But this is not just the recent history. If you take automotive as an example in Detroit, before the Chinese, pose a tangible threat. Back in the 60s, Toyota already begins to encroach the automotive sector in Detroit. And then it's the South Koreans, such as Kia and Hyundai, beginning to take on more and more market share. And as a result, Detroit become Rust Belt. So it's not just a question of survival of core company in the Western world or early pioneers, if you like, but it has implications to the industry cluster, economic outcome of an industrial base. 
which is why whether we are government or policymaker, academia or business executive, the threat of latecomer is really relevant. And this is where the initial thrust of the book, I try to really unpack and understand in a world when everything can be copied, when capital can move across the border despite tariffs, when IP could expire such as patent, and when employees can jump ship, moving from one company to the other, bringing their know-how to competitor. In such a world, when everything can be copied, how company can prosper, thrive, not just for the next decade, but over centuries. So I think the fundamental reason why latecomer often possess sort of a latecomer advantage, if you will, is because oftentimes in the nascent sector or when an industry is still in this early phase, you require craftsmanship who basically use harness the experience to make small scale production. So whether it's the historic way of building a solar panel or wind turbine, or as a matter of fact, making piano like Stanway and Sons, the best piano maker in the world, you require experienced craftsmen to handcraft this very expensive product. They are low volume and selling at a high price. What we see across industry is the latecomer because they can learn from reverse engineers, patent may, may expire. They can basically leapfrog the early pioneers, embrace mass production and automation, building on scale of production so that the unit cost is much lower and disrupt the world market. And critically, usually this latecomer in terms of capital requirement or profitability level, they're much lower than the early pioneer. Think about a German manufacturer versus a Chinese manufacturer. The profitability requirement obviously would favor the emerging market firm. Because of these two particular combination of reason that latecomer oftentimes have an advantage. However, here in Switzerland, I discover an industry cluster that looks very, very different than the rest of the industry I just showed you. And so I think this particular sector in Switzerland actually provides some kind of uh, way of thinking to overcome this particular challenge. And um, the industry I have in mind is in fact the world's pharmaceutical industry. So in Switzerland, there's a town called Basel in the north side of Switzerland, and that's the River Rhine, along River Rhine, there are all these pharmaceutical companies continue to lead the worldwide industry. Novartis and Roche, they have settled down River Rhine, not for 20 years, not for 100 years, but 200 years. So Novartis predecessors, Sieber, Geiger, and Sandals, these companies have settled down River Rhine for more than 200 years. They continue to be very prosperous, so as Roche as well. Basel, is not Detroit like Rust Belt. There, there is no latecomer from across the world who disrupt these early Western pioneers. Together with Pfizer and Johnson Johnson, they lead the drug discovery till today. So the key question is, how come this pharmaceutical industry feels so awfully different than the industry that I just showed you? And if there's a key lesson learned, how do we think about this strategic issue? so that company can actually thrive over the long run. So I decided to spend about three months going up to Basel to talk to engineers, scientists, and even historians. I want to understand what is the secret source that make Basel so prosperous. And the key question is not just IP and FDA regulation. Those are important. But the key question here is, how come there's no latecomer who learn how to discover new drugs? Because after all, there are 60% of the disease in the world that has no treatable treatment yet. So how come there's no latecomer develop their capability to discover new drugs for these new classes of disease and eventually compete against with Novartis and Pfizer around the world? And what I found out was sort of interesting. 
it turns out back in the turn of the century, we're talking about the 19th century, the late 19th century, um, you know, companies such as Sieber, Gagi, and Sandoz, they are merely chemical dye manufacturer who produce drugs for, uh, for, for the US market. Because back then in Switzerland, there's no patent law. And these chemical dye manufacturer discover some kind of medicinal benefit in their compound. So don't ask me how these chemists discover medicinal, medicinal benefit in the compound. They probably taste it by accident. But what they discover is the first blockbuster in the world. And it's called antipyrin. It's the fever reducing drugs. You think for a moment, a hotbed for innovation back then is all about organic chemistry. You have to be a chemist to discover the painkiller, for instance. Now you might remember back in high school, you learned about the story of Alexander Fleming, who discovered antibiotics. In fact, antibiotics is the study of fungus, the bacteria, the study of microbe, that these fungus will secrete more juice to suppress bacteria growth. After the Second World War, all these nascent pharmaceutical firms basically invest in a new discipline called microbiology. So they send in employees to collect soil samples around the world to bring back to laboratory for testing. You ask the pharmaceutical industry, what is hot today? What is the hotbed for innovation? Of course, it's the study of human DNA, genomics, bioinformatics. So if you look at the broad history of pharmaceutical, it's this constant leap from one knowledge discipline to the next and to the next. Huge implication to the way we think about competition. If the under, so competition is like climbing up the mountain. If the underlying knowledge stagnates, sooner or later, the latecomer would reach the same height. However, if the underlying knowledge continue to evolve so rapidly, like in the case of pharmaceutical, that's almost like having a constant mudslide that pushes everyone down. In this scenario, turns out it's the most experienced one, could have the more capability or opportunity to leap in the frontier. Why? Because back in the uh, 20s, if you want to understand microbiology, you need to grade as an organic chemist to start with. Back in the 70s, during the beginning of biorevolution, the study of human DNA, you've got to be a good microbiologist to begin with. So what you know in the past in fact, have a huge implication on how you can harness the next knowledge frontier. Now, so one of the key questions that I ask executives to reflect is that you have to assess your company foundational knowledge and trajectory. To what extent your secret source is known by others? The more widely known your secret source by others is the more um, danger that your company leading position may be surpassed by latecomer. Now, of course, not all industry are as scientifically intense as the global pharmaceutical industry, but once you have the lens of the leap, that organization must, lead, must need to leap from one knowledge discipline to the next and then to the next in order to thrive in a world when everything can be copied, it becomes a very interesting lens to look on the contemporary setting. For instance, you think about automotive industry, for the longest time, it has stagnated in terms of the underlying knowledge discipline. It's all about mechanical engineering based on internal combustion engine. Today, of course, it's all about electric vehicle as the next frontier and some kind of self-driving car based on software programming and machine learning and deep learning. This is basically in the space of data science. And then some kind of ride sharing scheme like Uber or Lyft or Grab or Uber or Didi. This is the next frontier knowledge for automotive industry to move forward. This is why practically across all the major automaker, everyone talked about the same strategic imperative. That is, they want to leap, they want to move into EV, they want to move to auto, uh, autopilot or self-driving car or come up with some ride-sharing scheme. So what we do at IMD in my research center 
is to compare and contrast which company in terms of industry incumbent just talk but with very little traction and which company actually gain tangible traction along the way. And from that regard, because I'm not mar uh, calculating the market power of the company, I'm more intrigued and interested about their ability to prepare for the future. This is why, sorry. Um, sorry about that. Just a little bit of a noise on the background. Um, because my, my interest is to looking at how much progress this company is able to prepare for the future, you can almost assume Tesla would be sitting on the very top, that's for sure. But I'm more interested about people below Tesla. Who are the traditional car maker can make tangible progress going forward? And this is a ranking that we published in the World Economic Forum, happy to share after the webinar and you can see all the methodologies. But what you're seeing here is that companies such as BMW on your number seven on the list is doing kind of good, but not great. And this is really dangerous because if you think about across all industry, most industry are going through industry consolidation for now. And what we learn is going forward, the number of cars sold may get reduced. And it is critical for these companies to stay really on the top end in order to thrive over the long run. And BMW is not the lack of trying. In fact, one year after Tesla have launched their Model S in the United States, they have launched BMW i, the i brand, the i3. A year later, they got the i5. And then there's no news. And in innovation, no news is bad news. What exactly had happened is because the new electric vehicle continue to have a lesser margin than the traditional car. Senior management actually shift a lot of advertising dollar away from the EV back to the mainstream car businesses. Um, so the key learning here is whether it's electric vehicle or self-driving car, these type of investment is going to be very expensive. Going through fun traditional financial analysis is not going to cut it. What that means is it requires different type of funding. If you think about GM, General Motors, sitting on number two, they also invest in similar initiative, except they would allow third party to invest because it's not a family owned businesses. They would allow it, the cruise automation, the self-driving subdivision, partnering with a Honda to launch pizza delivery in Japan slated by 2020. All of these means that even when you're a traditional company, you need to behave truly like a Silicon Valley tech giant in terms of not just the way you run innovation, but also the capital requirement. So why do I mention all these? Because as individual employees, you can look at this tangible signal, whether the senior management team have the willpower as well as the capability to scale this disruption going forward. After all, design thinking and lean startup methodologies, most well-run company would already install. But what is required is to scaling up this innovation. So it does have an implication on how you assess your own career prospect going forward. So we did a similar thought around other sectors as well, such as banking sector, as well as consumer packaged goods. And all these we are happy to share afterwards on the comprehensive analysis as well. But what we've learned is when an organization about to leap and going forward, as I just mentioned earlier, it needs to go beyond the sort of traditional financial analysis. So back here earlier, we spoke about when Novartis is almost moved towards by, uh, away from microbiology and launched the first uh, drugs, targeted cancer drugs, um, that based on the study of human genomics and bioinformatics. The way they launch this is interesting because inside Novartis, um, the executive don't want to invest in these new uh, drugs because it's gonna cost a lot of money and it only resolve a rare form of cancer. So the market size is actually quite limited. But the former CEO, Daniel Van Seller basically said, if these new drugs 
is not just about incremental revenue, but in fact, it would generate and come up with a new way of discovering drug going forward. It's a new capabilities. Then in the archive, I found out a quote by him. He said, money doesn't matter, full steam ahead. So there is always this need for top-down intervention before the company can truly leap to the next frontier of knowledge. Because oftentimes using traditional financial analysis will not be completely sufficient. So this is why oftentimes we see executives also need to ask themselves, what are some inevitable that your business and your function can leverage going forward? We spoke about in the auto sector is about you know, this idea of leap away from mechanical engineering to sort of electric vehicle, but more important, self-driving car based on software. You can think about banking industry as an example, retail banking. In the past, it's opening up brick and mortar store and allowing people to come to your branch and build up good client relationship to sell investment product. Going forward, it's about robo advisory, it's about coming up with mobile payment and mobile services, much like an e-commerce company, leveraging data science. And again, it represents a leap to the next knowledge frontier. In fact, if I were to summarize and abstract a level up, what we see is the um, valuation or the value derived from a company continue to shift away from tangible asset to the intangible. What you've seen in the past is whether your bank, your tangible asset is your branch. If you're automaker, your tangible asset is your factory. What we see over the years, the value of company increasingly is derived and attributed away from tangible asset, but intangible, such as your IP, such as your know-how, trade secret, but more importantly, is data, the algorithm that you build, things that we spoke again and again these days. And in fact, this is sort of an inexorable trend as well. With the rise of AI, what we're seeing is, is this final automation of human knowledge as well. In the past, most company have to make key decision using a small group of people. It's almost like you know, craftsmanship type of decision-making processes. So you think about marketing department, you would have very experienced marketing manager sitting together, making key decisions about a product feature. These days, of course, people are practicing mass production in terms of key decision making, like crowdsourcing. You put up a challenge online and get your user community to give you input in terms of the next product features. And AI and automation, robo advisory, self-driving car is the final automation around the knowledge domain as well. The implication becomes we are moving into the world of corporate inequality. From manufacturing to services, what we see is frontier company that can leap to the next knowledge discipline. They see the productivity per employee continue to search. Company or organization that do not leap as far and prepare as much, they see the productivity decline. Why? Because customer experience continue to rise. If I need to meet the competitor uh, delivery based on human hand, my cost structure would simply not be sufficient. So overall, what we've heard so far is this idea or simple question, how come across all industry, we see latecomer surpassing the early pioneers? And the typical result is, the typical reason is because when you're determined enough, there's nothing you cannot learn from early pioneer. And so the latecomer, oftentimes we see them from Asia, they start to embrace in large production scale and move up the value chain pretty dramatically over time. But then it's not the death of all industry. In fact, what we discover is if an organization can leap from one knowledge discipline to the next and then to the next, you can in fact thrive as an early pioneers. Then the key question becomes, where can your organization leap next? And I kind of mentioned two examples in the auto sector, as well as the banking sector, as an illustration. Obviously, different sectors have slightly different take on it. 
if your consumer packaged goods like Procter & Gamble or Nestle or Unilever, obviously today, the idea of direct to consumer reinventing retailing for the first time, you need to go direct to consumer becomes much key. It's the next frontier of knowledge for these organizations. Whether it's e-commerce or brick and mortar, it's about direct to consumer experience. Your logistic company, such as DHL, Ferdax, or shipping line like Maersk, then the idea is how can I make sure using the uh, IoT requirement, GPS uh, technology so that I can track and trace uh, packages and fulfill the last mile as e-commerce begins to take off becomes much and much more important. But the lens of the leaps does allow us to benchmark company just talking about the strategy versus those who can actually execute these leap much more on a tangible basis going forward. So I'm just gonna pause here and take in some additional question or related to human or people leadership so that we can have uh, some Q&A uh, for the remaining time. Thank you, Howard. Um, maybe one, <laughs> one uh, uh, different type of question. I see that uh, in one book you used uh, the frog and then the, so, <laughs> so why are you using different animals? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, that is pretty much also my own experience around, uh, you know, in the publishing for the first time too. Uh, turns out in the world publishing, uh, usually um, what happened is the U.S. book publisher that I signed up with in New York City, they sold the international right around the world. And so once the, uh, the product being sold, then as an author, we don't have much control in terms of the editorial. So what you see is the outcome of the kangaroo is the Portuguese version where they thought this would resonate with the local audience. Right. Uh, the Taiwan's version on the back, they use a rabbit. Um, the French told me they even changed the title dramatically. It sort of mean reinvent your business model before it's being too late. Because right. uh, evidently in France, um, they don't like to use a single word. Versus in Japan, there's no picture. So it does vary across right. the global audience. So okay. I guess we are also belong in the consumer packaged goods, uh, <laughs> you know, domain and the local knowledge is key. Okay, I was just curious, maybe, you know, a frog jumps maybe less farther than, uh, than a kangaroo. Um, so my, 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 when I was listening to you, one of the questions that got in, in my mind was, um, how much of organizational attention, um, you know, resources in a way, right, the human resources capital, would you allocate to uh, preparing, let's say, for the next leap? And, yeah. and, and how, how, how do you know where to leap to? So basically, those are two questions. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the resource allocation, it is critical for a company to have an overall plan because otherwise your existing main business would always crowd out anything around the domain of exploration. So smart company would instill so, sort of a rule of thumbs, right? You have R&D as an overall budget, but you carved out certain percentage and bring those product as an experiment all the way to go to market. Depending on the industry you're in, I've seen company will allocate as much as 20% or to as little as 3%. It's okay. It does vary across sector, but not having those plan uh, is, not, is not permissible because whenever their business downturn, the knee-jerk reaction is to cut off those investments in the future so that your near-term number looks good. But the start, mm. stop, start, stop would be so detrimental to the old long run of this innovation outlook. Um, so this is one way of I'm thinking. The mm -hmm. second question you have about sporting the next leap, mm -hmm. I think um, for individual benefit, right? I, I strongly believe even individual employee, you need to develop that capability. It's not just a corporate strategist guy who think about because the last thing you want is to work in a sinking ship. So very practically what that means is one needs to cultivate this intense you know, sense of curiosity, not just about your own industry, but it's also about other industry so that you kind of know what my industry dynamic is going through because mm -hmm. whatever have, is happening in auto, we in fact have seen it in IT a long time ago. Whatever happening in uh, global logistics, for, uh, for instance, um, there are certain analogy you can draw from healthcare. So it's this ability and disposition 
to be externally curious increasingly more and more important because we are living in a much more turbulent uh, situation as well. I saw David have a question on Q&A, right? Yeah, there, but I see another question here as well that I would like <laughs> to ask you first. Uh, Patricia okay. is asking, how does a company uh, in manufacturing consumer finished food, um, basically a commodity, that's what she's saying, uh, how does that company lead? Yeah, so this is interesting, right? If you are only thinking about developing consumer packaged food, goods in, in the food and beverage category, then it truly is mundane and boring and there's nothing much going on. But the empirical fact, what we see is whether it's microbrewery all the way to, uh, you know, the sort of uh, purpose-driven brand, they are growing much faster than big brands. What that means is, let's look, take a look at these small brands, right? Small brands are basically over the last five years, they're taking 15 billion US dollar away from big brand. So big brand is not just growing slow, they're losing market share. And if you're looking at small brand, typically what happened is they usually have a very strong purposeful brand behind. They are able to engage consumer as a community. They put up a hip website with an Instagram and reach out millions of users versus supermarket aisle can only reach one neighborhood. And the way they think about, of course, is through behavior online, behavior of your customer. So what income needs to think about is how can I bring direct to consumer into the much stronger next level? This is not about omni-channel. Omni-channel is whatever platform out there and make sure I can ship stuff around. <laughs> but direct to consumer is how can you control your brand to deliver an unparalleled uh, user experience direct to consumer by passing your distributor. Never mind about department store, they're collapsing. <laughs> so go and think about how can I engage consumer so that no longer PNG or Unilever is about a number of big brand, but this is an incubator can accelerate growth of a number of small startup brand. Of course, there are things that you want to share across for cost effectiveness, but more importantly is how to triangulate data across all these brands so that each of these marketing managers can really engage the target audience in a way that startup could not. That's the advantage of the future. The question by David is an interesting one. It's, it's probably practical and philosophical at the same time. So you mentioned knowledge automation as a mm. final destination. Right. So what about knowledge creation? Can creation be automated? Yeah, so this is a beautiful question. I don't think knowledge creation can be automated at all. And this is the reason uh, why I have such a strong point of view. Um, during this summer, I went to uh, Silicon Valley to talk to not just big company and startup, you know, the usual suspect, Microsoft and LinkedIn and Waymo, right? But also really talk to UC Berkeley and Stanford to talk to the leading edge data scientists who really know what AI is about, right? So these are world-class thinker in data scientists. No one can compete against them in terms of intellectual horsepower. And the way they describe artificial intelligence are two types. One is artificial narrow intelligence, like image recognition, playing chess game, and playing Jeopardy. Narrow intelligence, machines way better than human. There's no, there's, no, there's no purpose of putting human to inspect defect goods on assembly line better than machine. It just won't happen. But these data scientists also told me artificial general intelligence, like singularity, that machines are so smart, integrating the domain of knowledge that we would get displaced by machine. They said general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, we exactly make zero progress. So this is great news for human. Now this is not the opinion from Howard, this is the opinion from UC Berkeley and consensus from Stanford as well. Which means that human advantage is about integrating different domain of knowledge. We're so good in understanding human empathy, coming up with hypotheses, testing them in the form of experiment, to understand the causality by asking why, these are not the capability. The machine learning through correlation and large number of data is good at. And if you think about machine learning, you require so much information so that it can recognize a dog and a cat. Human don't learn like that. We use very small amount of data and we understand the best, uh, mental model already. So I think going forward, what that means is knowledge creation across particular integration, recombine idea, will continue to be quite a uniquely human endeavor. And we have to think about the way when it's mundane work, 
even it required years of expertise, you want to outsource to machine because performance wise, we're just bad. Then we focus on knowledge creation, integrate knowledge and run experiment, forming hypotheses. So I think this is uh, as philosophical as well as practical too. So I'm glad David asked that question. Thanks, Howard. Um, another question that comes up regularly uh, during the summit, but also uh, uh, over the last year at our face-to-face uh, -face conferences, is, is basically around who owns the innovation agenda. And, and so often there's unclarity about it, and it's a hot potato that, uh, especially when it comes to you know, longer-term investment, that no one really wants to own. Like in, in terms of, you know, is it strategy? Is it, um, um, you know, is it marketing? Is it is it business? And and so um, that lack of clarity around ownership also leads to a lot of um, confusion, you know, and, yeah. and 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 misaligned, let's say, priorities. So. In, yeah. in your um, examples, um, to successfully leap, what's the best, let's say, position of this yeah. quote unquote agenda? Yeah, so no one truly owns innovation entirely and everyone have responsibility. So this is a murky statement because which means no one is responsible, right? But mm -hmm. uh, let me give you a very concrete example. When a company successfully leap, what are the responsibility among rank and file and what are the responsibility for the top management team? And the example is Procter & Gamble. Because Procter & Gamble today is still leading the world you know, FMCG industry. Now, they have their challenge around e-commerce, but they have been around for 150 years. So a personal computer by HP and Dell displaced by Lenovo and Samsung, how could P&G lead more than 150 years to now? They should have displaced, not even by the Chinese, right? The Japanese and Korean could have displaced them big time, like in the auto sector. But what I see is, historically, they continue to leap from one knowledge discipline to the next, to the next from building big factory using mechanical engineering to running advertisement based on consumer psychology to later on, they launched the world synthetic detergent based on organic chemistry. So the brand Thai brand is PNG, pioneered the world first synthetic detergent. So it's not no longer natural soap. So it washed cleaner and better. So the science has actually persist, just like the Google venture model, the skunk work and doing, you know, rapid prototyping, lean startup, shooting away this initiative from corporate intervention. So they've done all that. But what's really interesting is when the organization scale this innovation. Now, this is definitely the responsibility for the top team. And this is why. Because in the wake of the launch of the Thai brand, there's almost this compulsive fear inside PNG. They thought, oh, is this going to destroy our natural soap business, the Ivory Bar brand, right? So the chairman of the board, William Coopers, he said, if anyone is going to destroy our natural soap business, it better be P&G ourselves. It's exactly like what Steve Jobs said. If we don't disrupt ourselves, someone else would. So throughout history in my research, I see a similar behavior by the top team, not just making big bad in the future. That's the wrong way of thinking about it but it's looking at evidence across the organization, which one is mature enough for us to scale. And then you move the organization into a deliberate strategy. So it's not one versus the others. Rank and file, middle manager, you do skunk work, you experiment, you try a lot of things, lean startup, we have to do it. Otherwise we don't even have the seed. But then it's also when the evidence becomes so important, no middle manager can push when there are infighting. It's the CEO, it's the board. If they're not doing that, then one must ask, why would they deserve such a position in such high pay? Uh, that's an interesting remark. And so uh, what do you do if you, if you well, have a sense that, uh, that, that, that that alignment is not really happening on that level? Then you've got to ask yourself, what type of career you want? Mm. Some people are really good in running the core business. And I think there's huge amount of value in that, right? Because if you don't run your core business well, then there's no opportunity to invest in the future. In fact, for all the lead company we're able to make, the unsung hero are the one who make sure the cash engine is continue to run. So if one recognized, I am a great leader in running the mainstream business, go for it. For some, always want to try something different. Some people simply have this defiance inside them. I've seen enough executive to get burned very badly because they couldn't distinguish the telltale sign of an organization. If you find yourself truly passionate about certain idea that you've been working for so long and hard, then one needs to use the sort of history 
as diagnostic kit to have a limits test to see whether this organization is actually will be able to move the needle because there are tangible behavior you can observe, not just in history, but also contemporary, such as Alibaba, such as Amazon. You can see that too, or Disney today on launching Disney Plus and so on. Um, that becomes quite an important signal for you to self-select an organization that you one could have a more fulfilling career over the long run. Thanks for that. And as a, as a uh, final question uh, from my side, and I don't see others on the chat, but if you do have still a question, uh, now is your opportunity to post it. Um, so most people in our audience are working in, in the innovation team, right? So not necessarily uh, in a position to quote unquote decide or push this idea forward. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest if you have a more limited uh, span of control? Yeah, so this is where you seize an opportunity to make your big ask. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes there would be board members, CEO will come over to the innovation shop to see what's going on. And this is very, very healthy. Now, if there are innovation that you see that require a major leap in terms of knowledge discipline, but more importantly, require the company to invest differently in order to scale this innovation, then they must be able to boil down to one or two specific asks, whether it's bypassing certain legal requirement, extra harmonization over the world, or postpone SAP implementation in this new venture, or requiring third party for investment. Otherwise, we simply couldn't fund this thing using our internal capability, open API, whatever you name it, you must be able to boil down to one or two technical asks that essentially go up against the traditional doctrine of the company. Those are the moments for you to test it out. Whether the company is truly willing and open to have a conversation around this dogma for pragmatic reason, or this is an organization essentially like Kodak, invent, in, in, inventing the first digital, digital camera and let Sony, Canon, Nikon to destroy a once great enterprise. Thanks. Anything else, uh, Howard, that we'd like to add before we close? Well, so as I said before, I think there are, there are one or two key attributes that distinguished uh, effective leaders these days, particularly in the space of innovation. One is this ability to think curiously and open-mindedly so that you can draw on lessons learned from other sectors. And the second one is the courage to engage in difficult conversation. Not, um, you know, conflict avoidance, meaning you will always get polite result. <laughs> polite result in innovation is a death nail. And so it's this ability and courage to engage in difficult conversation, but not to offend uh, executive too much so that you burn your bridges, uh, that becomes a very critical uh, attribute that I see successful innovator that stood above the crowd. Bonus question from Tom. Uh, where could a company like H&M go? H&M, like uh, the apparel company, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, they are facing so many pressures, so many different domains. I think, you know, for companies such as H&M would be very, very similar to the Procter & Gamble uh, sector, PNG. So maybe afterwards we could post online the additional paper that document this leap readiness index and we can share with our audience as well. But I think there are a couple of things. One is, you know, uh, apparel is also facing exactly the similar challenge as we see in big brand packaged goods company. So one is this direct consume to consumer, although they have a direct channel, but e-commerce is really changing people's habit. Second thing is um, sustainability. That, you know, for the longest time, people have been complaining or, or voicing their concern about uh, labor, sort of the labor condition of manufacturing in Asia for fast fashion. And alongside with sustainability and circular economy for H&M, I think when time is still on their side, they have to engage and think about how to reinvent your core business so that the sort of stigma, even when it's untrue and unfound, so that the stigma around the core operation will get eliminated as well as would be embraced by future consumer. Meanwhile, I think the whole idea of disposable apparel is also a major issue that requires H&M to think about in the long run to reinvent itself 
in the future. So for H&M, it's pretty tough because we're talking about dual transformation. I need to transform my today businesses so that it's acceptable and palatable for my existing audience. And then it, at the same time, is to think about ranging from circular economy to rental market like rental runway to different types of new material that is required so that there would be an alternative business model going forward. In order to prepare one day, if the paradigm shift, then H&M in fact have something ready on the shelf to pull the plug.